Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be having some late attendees, I'm sure, coming in along the way. Uh, this is What's Next, the discussion of performing arts in Southeast Asia post-COVID-19. And it's hosted by the Bandung Philharmonic. And I will be your moderator for this afternoon. My name is Irene Efren, co-founder and CEO of the orchestra. We have been joined this afternoon by some really great performing artists and also leaders of their various organizations in various countries around Southeast Asia. So we thank you also for your time, panelists. There's Dr. Joel Navarro, conductor and chorus master, currently teaching at Singapore Bible College. Dr. Joel Navarro has had a long and legendary career from the Philippines, moving to the USA, and now back to the Southeast Asia region. Dr. Joel Navarro, would you like to give an introduction of yourself and your projects and um, largely how COVID-19 has impacted uh, yourself. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Joel Navarro, uh, born in the Philippines, became a US citizen in 2010, but I now work here in Singapore. So I have been working as a conductor, as a professor of choral music, uh, as an author, uh, clinician, etc. So I've had, uh, well, my expertise has particularly been on, been on choral music and conducting uh, through, I'd say about 41, 42 years of uh, all that aggregate stuff. So teaching here in Singapore Bible College, and especially because it is in Singapore, uh, faculty have been so very busy with online tools of education. Um, if you can remember, the so-called circuit breaker of Singapore started quite early in March. And so from early March to about now, uh, it's still upon us. So we've had to conduct our classes online very quickly without any real, I would say, time to get ourselves acquainted, if not uh, on an expert level, to just simply stumble through or, or just go through the online teaching to be able to make sure that our graduates have the, um, uh, uh, how do you say, accomplish all the things that they needed to do on time. So we had to make do, our semester began mid-January and then it ended uh, end of April. So we had our graduation, uh, so to speak, uh, middle of early May. So from early May to about the end of June, we're acquainting ourselves with, uh, you know, uh, the use of Moodle, the use of WebEx and Meet. And I think just about today, we approved, uh, beginning from July, our next semester, the use of Zoom with all its updates and protocols they did a 90-day how do you say study of zoom to be able to approve it finally so we're going to use zoom for our online classes beginning july um, that's what we've done now as far as our choirs are concerned that's that's really been a problem and we just simply have to <laughs> swallow the whole thing and grin and bear it uh, we're not going to have to, you know, uh, get back to the old system of social and musical exchange like we normally used to have. But we're now going to emphasize, I think, uh, the fact that they need to be very clear about their particular vocal lines, etc. Through the use of online technology, they'll have to submit MP3s of their voices or MP4s of their videos, making sure that they're knowing all the different lines of, um, you know, the songs that will be assigned to them. I do not think we will be having a choral concert as we normally have um, at the end of the semester in virtual choir formats because. It's extremely difficult to make just one video because the production aspect, the post-production aspect is enormous. And that means we'll have to outsource that post-production thing. And 
it's just not going to be, how do you say, sustainable. Uh, so maybe in terms of the concert, we will be doing a little bit more of other ensemble work, like a solo, a duet, a quartet, and maybe just one or two, or maybe three, pushing it, uh, choral pieces for our end of semester concert. Uh, and that's all going to be online. What we're going to do is we're going to extend that concert in such a way that we're going to talk about um, the theme of the concert itself. So we're going to have to uh, make a storyline. Uh, 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 you know, this is all under the work, so I, I hope I don't uh, preempt the choral professor uh, by saying this, but it's still in the works. So we're thinking of um, a hymn festival, you know, where we're a religious organization after all. So thinking of hymn festival, the stories of the hymns, and we're going to touch on unusual themes that speak about the human nature, uh, especially themes that are underserved, under addressed, loneliness, depression, suicide, uh, same-sex attraction, and all that. We've done that. Uh, so we're looking at something else. Um, and it's pretty bold, I would say. I mean, I started it. I, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of an intrepid individual who wants to really, you know, grab the bull by its horns and say, hey, evangelical people, these are stuff that we really have to deal with in this, you know, day and age because, you know, the young people know about it, but old foggies like you and me, we're, we're sort of shying away from it. So we need to be able to att uh, attack it from an aspect of, of gentleness, of openness, of, of care and compassion. So those are our hymn festivals that we try to make. Uh, and we have an obligation to our audience, so we, we want to be able to do this. Uh, next, we have Dr. Ang Mei Fong. Thank you very much for joining us. She's an award-winning soprano, and she's also voice department chair at University Putra, Malaysia, and also founder of Song Weavers and several other uh, choral ensembles in Malaysia, as she has recently told us. I give you the floor. Yeah, right. Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you, Banjong Philharmonic, for the uh, invite. Um, yeah, myself, um, I have two very important things to do in my career. One is to perform and one is to teach. Um, so I'm going to share from uh, my experience um, from, from these two aspects. So uh, last year, I actually performed uh, as soloist um, in 16 productions, including one opera. Uh, so that was a very busy year. So this year, I already have initially uh, planned for eight to nine productions already throughout the year uh, until the December of this year. So um, when Malaysia was announcing this uh, movement control order, uh, I was still preparing a concert with the Kuala Lumpur Performing Arts Centre Orchestra to do a series of um, opera arias concert. So, and, and then definitely we have to cancel it. Uh, at that time, we were still feeling optimistic, even though a little bit disappointed that the concert had to be cancelled. Uh, but we were thinking maybe we can still postpone it to the end of the year or maybe next year. Uh, but now looking at this whole situation, we are, we are actually not too sure whether we are still um, feeling too optimistic if to postpone it to the end of the year or to the next season. Uh, but that's uh, something that we're going to discuss. So uh, when, when the whole situation developed, all of my concerts uh, was cancelled one by one um, from uh, March cancelled up to June, cancelled up to now, um, the whole year, you know, concerts were cancelled. And we do not know yet, you know, whether we should discuss about next year. So all was frozen. Uh, and in terms of teaching, I'm teaching in University of Putra, Malaysia. Um, and in terms of teaching, we were actually almost going into the half of the semester. So that was week six uh, when, when this movement control order was announced. Um, normally we have 14 weeks in our teaching weeks, so week six is almost touching the half. Um, and we have to, um, we, 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 we do not have a clear instruction yet, um, that first two days of, uh, since the announcement, but all these instructions come clearer from the university side, telling us what to do. Uh, and new timetable was announced. Um, so our whole semester was actually prolonged and postponed. 
Um, so after week six, we went into a uh, one week of rest and then one, two weeks of preparation for all the lecturers to get used to all these online platforms. And we got to, uh, uh, we were, we were there, there are actually a lot of uh, training uh, program for, for the lecturers to attend uh, on, for example, how to use the Google Classroom. Before that, I've never used Google Classroom before. Um, and for example, Microsoft Teams and uh, WebEx and Zoom, you know, now I'm so savvy with uh, Zoom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and then uh, we have a four weeks virtual classes, uh, which is not included in our um, original, you know, semesters or weeks. So uh, we can choose two weeks to do some experiment classes with the, with the, with the students. Um, then the movement control order was announced to be prolonged again and again. So now we have a latest timetable um, that tell us that our semester will actually uh, finish only uh, in August. So we are now in week eight, uh, you know, since week six, the movement control order was announced. So like we're almost two months already, but we're now, you know, back into week eight. Uh, but when we go through all this, uh, it actually also gives us time to think and to design what you wanted to teach in your class, especially the practical class, because I'm teaching uh, almost all the vocal related class, uh, individual um, voice chamber, uh, as well as choir. Um, so I started with some academics um, journal article reading because that's uh, also a very important thing for a university um, to do. Uh, students may go into voice research, they, they may go into choir research uh, in the end of the study. So I, I started them with some article um, reading. And I realized that um, being able to keep ourselves up to date is also very important. Uh, so I um, planned a, a training program for all our students to, to, to get to know how to record your voices and videos and to merge the files together. And I gave them a new assignment to do, which is to come up with a virtual concert in the end of the semester instead of a kind of like a conventional concert in the end of semester. So they need to learn how to merge the files together and come up with some dialogue and conversation uh, onto how they deal with the situation. Uh, so I, I hope at least they, they, are, they are skilled uh, to, to the latest skill at, at the moment, yeah, uh, onto this technology savvy thing. Um, so on and so forth. So there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of new thinking and new creative ideas onto how you can do uh, online teaching. Yeah, of course, uh, we miss this human contact so much and um, our students actually miss the, 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 the time singing together. Uh, but at the moment, we have to cope with this uh, more positively, I hope. Yeah, so that's my experiences. Uh, next, we have uh, um, Dr. Christopher Schaub from Thailand. He is the principal of Asun of the Thailand Philharmonic. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, I've been in Thailand for 15 years now. Um, I'm originally from the US and arrived here in Southeast Asia. I knew it was the place for me. And um, as Irene said, I play principal bassoon in the Thailand Phil. I also play principal bassoon in the Bandung Philharmonic when I can go. Um, and I have done so since the very, yes, it's been, it's been very sad for canceling all these concerts. Um, I've already had two months of orchestra, our own orchestra canceled. Um, but it's, we are very fortunate that our Dean has financially supported us during this time. We haven't gotten our entire pay, but we have gotten paid. So even without having concerts, and this is a big concern to the musical world, you know, with these things being canceled, that, that people can't support themselves. And there's so many freelancers. I, stories of my friends in the US who simply can't afford anything and are moving back in with their parents and these sort of things. So um, as, as long as this goes on, this is a, a, a major problem for a lot of, a lot of us. So um, anyway, I am fortunate in this regard. So, um, but, but a little bit sad. And, and one of our Bandung concerts was canceled too. So sad, but anyway, it is, it is what it is. So, um, so um, as far as my teaching, um, we've been very fortunate because we have a very unusual teaching uh, schedule. We had finished the second semester in the middle of February and then the quarantine hit a week later. 
So we were technically in break, which was absolutely perfect timing. We didn't have to over a weekend figure out how to teach online. And so um, what I did was I immediately opened a course on a summer course for my students just to see what was possible. And what I quickly realized was that live video is among the worst way to do music teaching. Um, the, this video has been pretty good so far, but, um, but I, the, even with very good video, the audio quality is not good enough to learn effectively. The most effective way to learn music is by rote learning. Teacher plays and student copies. It's been like this ever since the beginning of time. And to not be able to do that, even with the best, best circumstances, it's still not good. And it gets a lot worse from there. So I started to, I started to develop different ways. Um, Dr. Ang, you were saying about how asking your students to, to make videos and merge them together. Dr. Joel talking about making MP3s. I found that this, this is a much more effective way of doing it, is, is me recording myself, sending it to students, list, them listening to it, making their own recording. There have been numerous, numerous good things about this. So, you know, when a student comes to hear me play, they'll, I'll play it once or twice, and then they leave with that in their head, which they'll forget about probably in a day or two. But having an MP3 or, or a, a high quality recording means that they can listen to it all week long, which is a, a definite benefit. Um, and the, oh, sorry, someone's calling, sorry. So um, anyway, so, and I, I, I added benefit too of them recording also, because whenever you make a recording, there's this added stress level to it. And I think that students would prepare more for a video recording than for a private lesson even, where, where I can hold them to what they, what they have recorded, whereas, when they come into a lesson, they play it and then it's over right away. So um, I've seen that students really did really good work. And so what I did was I tried to do it twice per week. So do the process twice per week. And we reserve the online videos for talking like this. So maybe I'll play something and ask them to play. But um, other than this, um, the trying to think of innovative activities for them to do. That are, that are different than listening. So for example, um, give, sending them a recording of a great bassoon artist and giving them a specific assignment about interpretation. I want you to listen to this and write half a page about his articulation. Something like this. Something, make, make the students think about things in ways that they've never thought before. Um, and so I think there are lots and lots of, of opportunities for for innovative kinds of teaching that are aside from you know maybe 5g when 5g comes and it rolls out over the whole planet maybe we'll have access to higher quality higher quality audio and video but it's not here yet so um anyway so um so that's teaching wise so um the the last thing i do is administration and specifically what i do is i take care of international recruiting university but it's it's pretty large university we have 1200 full-time students from pre-college through doctorate we have two to three international guests a week these are people who come to do concerts guest professor internationally i mean look at the the bandong phil i mean your conductor and your chief teacher there and you've got so many guests who you know so for for the time being you know, when we do start making music again together, it's going to be local. So this presents um, obstacles, but it also, I think, presents opportunities. So like here in Thailand, we are, our chief conductor is Italian, and we have, most of the conductors we have are international guests, which we have a lot of. And so it's not going to be that, it's going to be Thai people. Um, and that's a wonderful opportunity for, for them and for us. And so things will be a lot more local when we do start them up. Um, so just other things that, that I have, being a, a general administrator, have tried to stress. Again, we have not been teaching formally. Uh, we start school on the, in the end of this month. So the things that I've been trying to stress is that we pick a platform and use one platform. So um, obviously there's Zoom and WebEx and all these other things, but um, so the argument was that, well, we should just allow teachers to use what's comfortable for them. 
And I made the argument, I don't think that's, that's what we should be doing. We should be doing what's best in the best interest of our students and having them learn four different systems and, you know, Google classroom and this, and it's, it's not fair to them. They, they're actually our customers, you know, um, they pay money to study with us and we, it, it's part of the quality of, of what I think we should be doing. So, um, and, and also, um, getting everyone, all the, all the, the teachers, you know, we have a lot of, um, people who aren't IT savvy and, and getting them up to, up to what we plan to be doing. So, um, there's a whole lot to think about. So thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Chris. I liked, uh, that you shared a little bit about the, uh, that you shared a little bit Okay, testing, am I back on? Am I back on? So I like that Chris shared a little bit about the innovative ways of teaching. I think that shows real leadership as a teacher and how you stress that it should be at this time um, about the students because that's also acts of leadership. Um, I, especially like your comment about 5G because I think it's more, I think 5G will roll around faster than the vaccine, to be honest. So. That's something that's been going on in my mind. Anyways, next, uh, we have Leslie Tan, who is artistic director and founder of Bach in Bali Chamber Music Festival. He's also cellist of Tang Quartet, Singapore's premier string quartet. Um, and they've performed all around the world for many, many years. And um, up until very recently, which I think Leslie will share a little bit about that, he was the chamber music professor at NUS, National University of Singapore Conservatory of Music. To you, Hi everyone, nice to be here. Um, as um, Irene has just said, um, until recently I was still, I still have two students um, um, at the conservatory, but as a chamber musician, I'm no more in contract. Um, and that has to do with, not directly to do with the, the virus, but we were looking for a new violist and we found someone and he couldn't come to Singapore because of the shutdown and everything in, in UK and then he couldn't come to Singapore and so then we without a violist and so therefore we couldn't get a contract and that's that's that was the thing um but part of me I mean we've I, all of us and I feel the pain right all of us have gone through having um uh, concerts cancelled and everything in fact at this point gabriel and i are supposed to be in america with our red uh, baroque group red dot baroque and it cost us a lot of money to apply for a visa for me and everything and i got the visa and it's not easy to get one of these visas you know you have to prove that you are top of your career and blah 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 and all that and we applied for it got it and then this virus hit us so a lot of these things being cancelled but the subversive side of me feels like maybe it's about time um, like Chris said you know we begin to explore new things um, and actually sometimes we fall back like with online teaching I've, I've, I've realized that what we've been doing for a long time you you get into a, a routine and you lose sight of what is the best way to engage your student because you've been doing this because this is a habit you just carry on with it but so with online teaching you you're forced to do very different things uh, the students are now forced to think differently as well and i think that's a very good thing and i've been finding i've been taking this time to rethink a lot of strategies teaching strategies and also performing strategies what what you can do what we can do going going forward you know definitely teaching is one big thing um we were lucky at the conservatory because sort of uh we are supposed to be on, on vacations now this is our summer break so when the virus hit us it was sort of in april we stopped classes right there and then um we only have one this is unusual because we have one batch of seniors who graduated without having to go through exams they did not have their proms nothing so i feel sorry for them you know they were all like oh we want to play our last concert and they couldn't do it well, on the other hand, hey, you know, you graduated and you're lucky. You don't even have a, you don't even have a grade to your 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 your, your degree. You, you know, whether it's A, B, C, you don't have a grade. And so, in a way, that's good, I guess. Um, but I can I can feel their pain as well. 
um, but we were lucky. So we are still on vacation and the semester only starts in August. So we still have a couple of months and we'll see what happens. I think we will be able to go back. Um, but with chamber music with and and I I am an ensemble musician. That's going to be difficult. How are you going to um, rehearse? But then that's the other thing. I mean, there are I, the, the, all these different platforms that you can use. And I know, like with Jam Kazam, apparently if you don't do the video, you still can do the just the audio thing. It works. Um, very minimal lag. And I agree with Chris. I think once. Uh, 5G comes, but that again is very political. It depends on whether the Americans will allow Huawei and all that. You know, it's all a big thing because Huawei has the the lion's share of developing all of the 5G, right? But that's another story for another day. Um, but as a chamber musician, I realized that it is very helpful because when we were studying how to play quartet in America, we were made to sit in different corners of the room and play and learn how to cue rather than just sit next to each other, right? Within spitting distance, we, were, we had to sit in far, far away corners and learn how to play together. We were, um, uh, we were made to sit with our backs facing each other and listen to, bod listen to breaths, how we breathe and learn how to breathe. And be therefore, your, your senses need to be a lot more acute. And I think this is a very good time as well. Even with me as a teacher, I, I, online, you, the sound is terrible. But you look at the bowls, you look at their fingers, and you, you you sort of begin to form an idea of what sort of sound for a string musician anyway. I don't know how it, it works for a singer or for, for a wind musician, right? But for, for a string musician, you get, my students always make, they've been making the excuse that, oh, no, I, I, I'm playing soft enough. I say, no, I'm not stupid. I look at your bow. This is not pianissimo. You know, you're using fortissimo bow. It's not possible. So don't don't argue with me. So I think uh, it has, in a way, brought us back, brought me back to the origins of, 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 of why I wanted to be a musician and how I was trained. Um, and I think it's a very good thing. It's sort of, it's a reset button for me. I mean, I, yes, I don't like the deaths. I don't like people falling sick. That's, that's, we're not here to discuss that. But as, a, as an artist, this is a reset and now the fact that we are sitting here in uh, on an afternoon having a discussion means that we are starting to be creative again and trying to find new ways of, of reaching out to audience and finding ways to engage people um, and to how we can teach students and all that so i think that's that's very crucial we have to rethink all these things so i think that's very important so um i will it's it's something that uh going forward, we need to think about. Thanks, Irene. Thank you Irene. very much. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, I think I also heard a little bit of financial loss in there. Just wondering, is that reimbursed at all? Or is just something you just have to bear personally? I think it's something that we all have to bear personally. I mean, we, okay. the, the government has come up with different schemes for freelancers and all that, but, but a lot of it, we just have to bear. And just one last thing, as, uh, as musicians, as artists, Right, this whole quarantine, this whole stay home, this isolation, they're so used to it. This is what we deal with when we need to prepare a concert. We are in isolation. Then we come out and we play that concert and we go back into isolation. And for me, I, when we opened up in Singapore, just eased the, um, the isolation. And I was getting anxiety last week. I'm like, okay, I'm going to hear buses again. I'm going to hear the cars again. I, I, was getting, I was suffering mild anxiety attack because we were opening up. It's the strangest thing. Well, it's a strange world and we're living in very strange times. Thank you very much, Leslie Tan. Uh, last but not least, we have with us Gabriel Lee, who is a virtuoso violinist in a wide range of genres, from classical to pop fusion with his group, the Lorong Boys, and also the Baroque Ensemble, Red Dot Baroque, which Leslie is also a part of. Um, other than that, Gabriel is also founder and artistic director of Music Society of Myanmar. So props to getting uh, music stuff happening over in Myanmar. Over to you, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you to uh, Bandung Phil and Irene for having me here. And thanks to Irene for making me nervous. I just learned that I was going to play a little bit of a Myanmar harp uh, for you guys uh, as an introduction. So here goes, hopefully. 
I don't feel, but uh, don't judge me, yeah, I'm a violinist. <laughs> okay, everyone can see, right? Okay, just a little bit lower. That's it. <laughs> All right, I think I'll go back to playing violin. That was great, by the way. Thank you very much, Gabriel. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so as Irene mentioned uh, just now, um, yeah, um, me and Leslie, we we direct the Music Society of Myanmar, and um, the last time we were in Myanmar, we we did a mini festival. It was called a Cool Week, uh, and we never expected that that would be our last time being in Myanmar, probably for the next few months and probably most probably the rest of the year as well. Um, but yeah, things, things are unpredictable and uh, yeah, you know, we've been trying to monitor the situation to see, um, you know, how things uh, develop over the world. And uh, as we as we monitored the situation, we were thinking, you know, is it going to be possible to do our festival and competition this year? Usually we do it in July, um, but uh, we realized then it's not going to be possible. And then the next thing was, should we still do it? Um, the lazy part of me was like, oh, maybe we should just take a sabbatical, take a break, you know, this year. But then we also felt that, you know, it's really important to continue to engage the community um, while everyone is staying at home and to encourage everyone to stay at home and, you know, continue practicing on their instruments, give them something to look forward to. And hence, we decided to uh, bring the festival online this year in July. And uh, I mean, that means that it's going to be a lot of work, but we also saw the advantage of doing that in that um, we could then involve a lot of artists who usually will not be able to uh, fly down to Myanmar for the festival. So this year we've actually, um, we were going to already involve the biggest number of artists, uh, about 20-ish, um, but because of this online format, now we can inf even open it up to even more people. So this year we're going to actually have more than 30 uh, festival artists and um, almost every aspect of our festival is going to be online. The competitions, the online seminars, workshops, panel discussions, virtual concerts, uh, even our community outreach is going to be online. So with the community outreach, we will be reaching out to about 300 um, children um, from the villages in Myanmar. And uh, that, that project is titled uh, Portraits of Myanmar. So we're going to get them to use everyday items to make music and in collaboration with us and also some, some visual arts as well. So um, that's for the Music Society of Myanmar. And um, as Leslie mentioned just now, also with Red Dot Baroque, uh, we were supposed to have a US tour this year in the summer, and um, we still have quite quite a packed calendar uh, from August onwards. So we hope that we will be able to uh, proceed with those concerts. Um, but we have also tried to take advantage of this uh, time to, you know, um, because usually most of us are in different parts of the world. Our artistic director, Alan, uh, usually he's, he's in the US, he comes back for every project, but now we can connect online. Um, and we've been doing um, various, uh, actually two online uh, collaborations. So I actually directed and edited the first video called Strike the Virus. It's a play on a Baroque uh, tune called Strike the Vow. And so we changed the, change the lyrics and everything to make it funny. And uh, then we did a second one, which is a more educational video teaching people about Luli and how, you know, he, that's the beginning of conducting, right? And um, so we've been trying to do more of this digital collapse. And also we are very lucky to have the National Arts Council in Singapore. Um, and they recently released this digitization grant, which we took advantage of. And uh, we, we applied for it, we successfully got the grant and with that, that grant we, were, we are planning to do two music videos to um, we've always wanted to do music videos but they are so expensive right but this with this with this initiative um, 
that gives us the possibility of doing like really high quality, high production value music videos that we'll be able to reach a wider audience. So uh, yeah, with that, uh, that gives us quite a lot of stuff to do in addition to hopefully when, when concerts resume in August with social distancing, um, we, will, we will be able to continue our concerts from there. Um, and uh, I've also been, I mean, besides this, I've uh, had quite a few things planned in Southeast Asia this year. Um, supposed to have a concerto in uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, but that, that has been postponed. Um, a few symposiums uh, to be a part of are all, all going to be postponed. Um, but I thought, you know, it's going to be um, such a great opportunity for us to use this time where everyone is so connected online, everyone is teaching online. Um, and then all, with all, all the colleagues that I've met um, in Southeast Asia. So we, we actually formed a Facebook group called Southeast Asia String Community, where we share our teaching videos. We do live uh, Facebook um, videos where we discuss pedagogical topics. And that has been one of the things that actually um, I teach as well. You know, teaching music online is what I teach at the Yong Sito Conservatory of Music. And, uh, you know, it's it's such a suddenly, you know, everyone sees the relevance of it. Before that, everyone is like, oh, teaching music online? Like, no, nah, that's that's not good. You know, it's not going to be effective. Um, but suddenly everyone is teaching music online, right? And um, so suddenly there's there's been a lot of interest in that. And when, when the conservatory suddenly had to take all our um, lectures online, I was like, okay, well, there's, there's nothing new here. You know, I've been doing this online. And so for us, the, the, the transition was very um, easy. You know, everyone was equipped. Everyone was um, very, very familiar with the online platforms already. That's how we've been teaching our students online during the module. And so now um, we're going to even expand the course to non-NUS students. Uh, to freelancers, uh, taking advantage of the government's uh, various schemes like the Skills Future uh, for freelancers, where they get paid per hour to actually go attend courses. That's our government's um, way of trying to upgrade everyone, encourage everyone to upskill. And um, yeah, there's also been quite quite a bit of in interest on playing music online. So that's possibly one of the modules that might emerge also uh, in the future. And um, yeah, with this um, teaching music online, um, the ABRSM also approached me to do um, four series, a series of four videos. So they commissioned me to do a series of four videos to share um, about teaching music online, the various um, advice, tips, and stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, in you know, and all, all all of this actually, basically. Um, Still, the main source of income for us, I think, during this time is is teaching violin, teaching you know the various stuff that we teach, and um, yeah, I found that it's it's during this time where even there's even more interest because everyone is at home, everyone can really practice, and you know they they have suddenly so much more time, right? They don't have to travel back and forth, and um, so yeah, I mean that's uh, that's been something that I've been doing more. I've actually been even taking in more students. I even just I had a new student from Malaysia yesterday, uh, from MOA. Like usually, you know, you wouldn't think that um, that's possible, right? Because you would usually want to find a, a teacher in the local, in, 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 in your own country. But now everyone is like, um, it's like uh, we are all, we are all kind of, um, there's a little bit more competition in the sense that everyone can um, look for teachers outside of the area. So, yeah, I mean that's that's been a short short um, overview of what I've been doing during this time. Thank you very much. One thing I really like is uh, humor. You kept to have a um, sense of humor in all of this, like with the um, strike the virus video. And I've been seeing some videos from your Instagram that's actually really hilarious about teaching <laughs> online. So it's really important to, and I really value that you are able to keep humor um, in such a time like this. Yeah, I think that's what we really need right now. Yes, <laughs> thank you again for that performance of, what, what's the name of the instrument, by the way? Uh, it's a Myanmar, Myanmar harp called a saung. Saung, 
Yeah. So, okay. Thank you again. <laughs> um, as for ourselves, the Banjong Philharmonic, it is the, an orchestra that was launched in January 2016. And prior to January 2016, there was no professional symphony orchestra in Bandung. If you have not been to Bandung, I'll give a little bit of context. It's the third biggest city in Indonesia. And in 2018, it was a population of 2.5 million people. Um, it's the capital of West Java. So prior to 2016, there was no orchestra. Since January 2016, my colleagues and I, we've held symphony concert series with 60 to 70 size international standard orchestra. Um, it was conducted, our concert series is conducted by Maestro Robert Nordley from Chicago. And uh, it's a city that doesn't have a concert hall. So we conduct our concerts in a theater, in a very old theater called the Dago Tea House uh, up to, until 2018, I believe. And then in 2018, we started collaborating with the Hilton Bandung a hotel, ballroom, to host uh, concerts there. And what we did was we literally built an acoustic stage in the ballroom and we built panels and we built um, hanging panels and reflectors. So it was really, we magicked. <laughs> I'm very, very proud of our stage team because we just magicked the ballroom into a concert hall. And you can all see our concert videos on uh, our YouTube channel, Bandung Philharmonic YouTube channel. Uh, so that was that. And then we also have a chamber music concert series and we have children concert series, which are in collaboration with the French Institute in Bandung. They have a small hall, which uh, is suitable for chamber music and for children concerts. We also have a very robust music education program directed by Dr. Michael Hall and my colleague Fauzi Wiriadi Sastra. We worked with 15 music schools around Bandung. Sorry, we worked with 15 schools from uh, universities to high school to kindergarten even to introduce orchestral music to the students regularly. And uh, in 20, August 2019, we launched our version of El Sistema, which some of you might have already heard of that. It's a movement that started in Venezuela um, back in the 1970s, which is basically an initiative to teach orchestral music to, uh, which is basically an initiative to teach orchestral music to underprivileged children. So we launched our El Sistema communities in four centers prior to the pandemic lockdown, two orphanages, one refugee center, and one suburban school center. And we were working on two more new centers before the lockdown. Um, then the lockdown happened and we had to cancel concerts. Uh, we had to pause our uh, community ensemble program because the students we were working with were too poor. So they didn't have laptops. They didn't have money for bandwidth for internet. So we couldn't do online teaching because they didn't have that. Um, but we kept our music teachers on a 50% payroll. Um, and then because of the situation in Indonesia, some musicians have fallen underneath the poverty line because all of their income has uh, income stream has stopped. And so we also participated in an initiative to give financial aid to some musicians that had zero income during this last couple of months. And some of them were um, to an extent in which is quite dire. So to the need, to the extent which like, oh, we need money to buy food or we need money to keep being able to live here that kind of situation in Indonesia. So we participated in that. Um, and we have actually continued to reach out to our audience through our digital marketing partner. So that was one uh, partner that we worked with that we maintained, even though we had to try to save a lot of money because financial crisis and all. But we decided to maintain that because uh, we had to keep amplifying our social media presence as that was the way that we could reach out to our audience at this time. Uh, we've tried many things um, such as hosting this webinar is an initiative that we, uh, we started and then hosted an Instagram live talk. Um, I had to do that and I never did that before. I was very nervous. Um, and also we posted some previously unreleased videos. So concerts, um, it was a ch children music concert that we didn't release. And the kids that participated in that really liked that. It was really great for their families. So I think that was a good thing. 
Um, so that's kind of uh, an overview of the Bandung Philharmonic and how the pandemic affected us. Looking ahead to what's next, uh, for us, um, we're very aware that we're entering into a time of financial crisis. Most companies in Indonesia, at least, are bracing for about a year to a year and a half. So maybe until the end of next year, end of 2021. Um, so that's uh, a challenge to be able to perhaps fundraise for concerts and for uh, continuous existence even of organization. Um, not to mention, then there's also uh, corona logistics that we are going to have to deal with. Um, like I said, I think 5G will roll out faster than the vaccine. Um, but I think the, the way to go about that is to take it slow, but try. Try to host a live concert, small, very restricted, um, maybe end of this year, work out all of the logistics and uh, figure it out. But try because uh, we believe, I believe, I believe that there's magic happening in a live concert performance. Um, of course, it will have to also be live streamed. So there's going to be that option. People can attend virtually or a very limited amount of people can come to a local chamber music concert. As um, Chris was saying, things will probably go local for a while. Um, so there's that. And then um, just I'd like to share a little bit about our mind frame going into this next year and a year and a half is we're going into for sure a crisis. So I think we have to think about like crisis management mode. So we should prepare ourselves, first of all, on how we're going to do the marathon because it's going to be a long one. So how to stretch out our resources. Um, and we should, I think we should equip ourselves with financial management uh, strategies and very solid, uh, very prudent finances for the upcoming times. And how to equip also our team members and our musicians, because uh, some of them might not be able to have that knowledge. Uh, some um, practical tips would be First thing, if you need help, like financial help now, you should say and you should speak about it. Don't wait until you have to get into debt a month from now or two months from now because um, income might not yet be available. So if at this time you need financial help, you should attempt to get help right now. That's one of the practical things that, um, that we learned about finance management. Um, also, communication is so important right now at this time. Uh, with your team members. Um, so engage, engage your team members, figure out who your core team members are uh, in your organization, in your chamber group, in your orchestra, in your choir, in your management, and engage them in how they think we can go forward. Talk out worst scenarios, um, worst scenarios that can happen, and really figure out how you can survive that. Talk about hopeful great scenarios and how that can play out. But communication with your team members. Um, here I'd like to share a personal story. I just recovered from dengue. And here I am worried about corona and bam, I get dengue. And it's almost as bad in the set. It's not as infectious, but it's almost as dangerous. And I was immobilized for one week in a hospital bed. And the only movement I was able to do was go to the bathroom and that was with help. So I had to go to the bathroom with help. And during some nights that was really critical, I couldn't go to the bathroom. So I had to have a piss pot underneath me to excrete my waste, sorry. Um, but during that time, I realized that uh, stay home is not that bad. <laughs> when you have to, when the only thing you can do is stay in bed and really was immobilized, staying home and being able to move around was not bad at all. It felt like heaven. So a change of perspective, uh, perhaps extreme, but that really helped in my uh, in attitude in uh, approaching what's coming up next for the future. And also the second thing I learned from that was I never relied on my team more. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I couldn't even go to the bathroom. So I never relied on my team more at such a time. And I never relied on other people. So that is another uh, learning lesson is that survival is a team effort. You're not gonna make it on your own. 
And uh, if we're going to survive an upcoming financial crisis, um, a change of how performing arts is going to be, you've got to do it with your team and you've got to engage them and everyone needs to be on board, um, affirming their beliefs and, um, and just trying. So that was the second thing that I learned. And I'm really grateful for all of my team at the Band of Philharmonic for being so solid uh, throughout this time. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Dr. Joel Navarro for your sharing about what's coming up next. What's coming up next? Um, I, I'll be uh, on gear for uh, teaching this next semester. Um, I'm doing a second book on conducting um, and maybe a third on a series of songs by an American composer, Dan Forrest, maybe analyzing his work and then giving some tips for choir conductors on how to teach uh, these works. And, and it's in collaboration with Dan Flores, of course. But uh, I retire <laughs> this November. I'll be going back to Manila and maybe help out along some community work there, uh, etc. But for the school, uh, Singapore Bible College is going to continue, but on full online education. Um, we're all geared up. Uh, or planning to gear ourselves up uh, feverishly with uh, the apps, learning management systems and becoming, you know, fully on board with everybody else. So we're, ah, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and especially for musicians who tend to be right brain, you know, this left brain stuff is a little bit of a stretch. So, um, and since I used to teach mathematics before I became a musician, it comes sort of naturally for me and I am able to help out my colleagues a little bit better. So that's what's in store for me. And uh, I do a lot of mentoring for my doctoral students back in Manila where I teach online as well. So uh, it's a love of my, my, my life, mentoring and writing. So that's what's it for me. Not so much performing anymore. Let's give it to the young Turks and to the eager, beautiful ones, you know. Uh, but uh, certainly mentoring and writing, I love. And I compose, so. Thank you very much. I think mentoring especially, um, and you were in a mentoring session just before this. Mm -hmm. um, right now, as we, as the younger generation faces this crisis, I think mentors is a really important um, source to be able to reach out to. I know I benefit from my mentors, so. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, on over to Dr. Tamefong, please. Right, sorry for the delay. I was looking for the button to unmute myself. All right, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll be also sharing from my um, different aspects of my works. Uh, so first I will start from my performance um, career. Uh, so at the moment we know that we cannot do live concerts anymore, but we do have uh, local associations who started to think probably um, we can try to do some recorded live sessions um, because now we are in this uh, continued control movement order uh, with some, uh, some restrictions being lifted so that we can have more freedom now uh, to meet or probably to work together in a smaller group so we are looking for ways whether or not we are able to do a um, uh, an online concert um, the idea behind this is to keep the industry alive because we realize that with all this cancellation it, it actually do not affect the musicians themselves but also affect all this um, for example concert halls uh, the managements and and uh, and, and all this um, uh, behind the scenes um, staffs, for example, those who do the lighting designs and all that. So um, um, th there is this organizations, um, actually a group of musicians and uh, performing arts artists, they, they group together and call Be A Part uh, in Malaysia now that they wanted to do a recorded live uh, concert. So I'll be um, taking part in this. Uh, nothing's firm yet because we need to get license uh, from the uh, um, Ministry of Culture. Uh, so once this is confirmed, then we probably would do a, a, a recorded live session and it will be, um, they will try to sell some tickets and also try to get some fundings um, and donations. 
so partly is to keep the industry alive and also uh, to advocate, you know, for all these um, performing artists, yeah, behind the scenes and on the stage artists. Uh, so yeah, so that's the performance side. Um, and uh, for teaching, uh, our instruction uh, from the Ministry of Education here in Malaysia is very clear that we'll be continuing with all this online teaching until the end of uh, the year for the tertiary level. Um, we do not know yet what's happening for the primary schools and secondary schools, um, but for universities, we are continuing with all the online uh, methods until the end of the year. So uh, for all my classes, I'm trying to uh, do some, something different, maybe to work with uh, other universities so that we keep our students' um, interest into learning um, a life and also keep them positive and all that. Uh, I think they, they need all of this now because um, it can be quite, um, uh, how to say, uh, lonely, you know, when you are facing the laptop the whole day yourself. Uh, and if you're doing too much of the academic studies and then the students may feel like, you know, all these classes have become so academic and then all, everything practical has become um, writing and papers. Um, so I'm trying to do more practical uh, things with the students um, in, more creatively. So work with other choirs and work with other students from other university may be something that is workable since the world has become smaller now through all these online platforms, uh, you know, from all your sharing just now, we can hear that before you were unable to invite artists from other countries that now you probably can invite them through Zoom or through these platforms. So uh, this is something exciting and I, I think this is the, um, the, the good side of doing um, all this online teaching. So we wanted to minima uh, maximize all these experiences. Uh, so, so that is part of the, um, the plan. Uh, I did also come up with, because um, after we try with all these online classes, I, I came up with a Google question and asking my choir students uh, how do they cope with the latest um, new arrangements for choirs. Uh, when we insert more of the academics uh, articles, are they coping well? Um, and how do they miss singing together? So uh, we will see. Uh, I've just uh, launched this questionnaire. Uh, one two days ago, so we will I, I will see the students' feedback, and uh, that will guide me further onto how I can actually uh, plan further. Uh, this is to hopefully balance out what I wanted to do, and also to take care of their um, their, their their mental well-being in terms of preparations for classes and all that. Uh, and uh, I am also an active researcher in the uh, field of um, voice vocal science, so. Um, I am also planning to write articles on this, um, and I, I do have some postgrad students as well. So uh, definitely some supervision sessions into uh, vocal signs um, and uh, especially in the voice rehabilitation. Uh, so so yeah, quite busy, uh, but all through online uh, platforms, right? Uh, May Fung, we have a question from the audience for yes. you. Yeah. And can you give a practical? You said that you gave your students training on how to create better voice recording. Ah, yeah. Yes, can you give a practical tip here on how to give a better voice recording? Um, okay. Mm. Well, I think in terms of getting a good recording outcome, you will need good devices. So the first thing is uh, whether or not you are prepared to invest uh, to, to good devices, for example, microphones. Uh, yeah, but if you do not prepare do, to invest into, into all this, you can start with some basic apps from your smartphone first. So people were saying maybe GarageBand for iPhone user. Um, there's another one for the, uh, uh, what was the other, the, um, the other, the, the other system? Um, uh, does, uh, the, the, did uh, Leslie mention it? Uh, Android. The Android system, sorry, I'm actually using Android, but I cannot call it out. Uh, the, the, uh, let me check, what do I have in my phone? Yeah, Audacity, there is an app that's called Audacity in your Android uh, system. Uh, you can, you can, you can ex experiment on this first. Yeah, uh, often I think, um, uh, what to say, you, you learn from errors, yeah? After you uh, recorded all this, then you, you probably feel like, oh, oh, it sounded like quite not good and hmm, I probably need to save some money to get some good device. 
yeah, so device is the, 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 the thing. Um, and uh, after you have recorded, you need to learn a little bit of this um, editing skills, which for us musicians, honestly, I have not trained um, in, into editing voice. Um, but but there, is a, there, there is a course in our music department here in UPM. Uh, it, it's the introduction to um, sound engineering. So we do have some students who already have some training in, in, this, in, this, um, in, in this field. So hopefully um, combining what they have uh, learned from the workshop and from what they have learned in the courses, hopefully we can come up with some, um, you know, hopefully good um, a recording. So audio is, is, is one. Another thing is uh, to edit the video itself. So what do you do uh, to have a good outcome is that you edit your video individually and then you, you, you extract your audio out from the video and put it into an individual file. You, you edit the audio file and then you, you also edit the, uh, the, the, the visual file. Then you put these two together again to make a better um, outcome. Yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds easy, but it's, it's, it's more complicated than this. It needs a lot of try and error and you learn from it. Yeah, but I think this is one of the new skills that maybe we all need to learn. For musicians, probably we just need, I mean, not just, but you, you, you got to start from there and then you, then you know how to get um, to better outcomes later. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing a bit of that. Um, I'll go on next to Chris. Okay, so, um, so in, in Thailand, the, the situation was handled very well. Um, the number of people who have it and passed away was, was always very low to the point where now things are opening up. And so this past week, they opened the movie theater. I didn't go, but I know that they have very strict policy for how you enter the room, how you sit together. Pe only people from the same family can sit in seats together. It's, it's very, very controlled. So um, our university has canceled all classes until the end of June. Um, has not made announcement yet, but we are planning on opening this semester on June 29. And what we're doing is all lecture courses are taught online. If it's a private course, it can be taught safely because it's within the, the, the rules established by the government for safety spacing in a room of appropriate size, which is a studio for two people, safely. Um, small ensembles and possibly large ensembles. Large ensembles will be half the size of normal, but we also have, um, we also have very large spaces. And we also have the rules for how the distance but String players need to sit, they can wear masks. Wind players need a lot more space and singers need huge spaces. So choir is going to be an, a huge problem. So I, what I've been thinking about mostly is going back to what a few of you have mentioned about um, countries what that, um, where it was handled very well, like Thailand, people have been in home for months. These people are going to be, have anxiety when they go out. They're not gonna wanna go out. Um, in my mind, what we need to do is we need to show the benefit of live music as soon as possible. And as we do open up, the answer is going to be chamber music. We could be seeing something like a renaissance of chamber music. We, we have small spaces. We have a small number of musicians. Obviously, um, singers are a danger unless they're wearing face shields or something like this. I'm not sure, but a string quartet. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, in we, I, I think we need to start doing this as soon as possible. Live music needs to be the thing. And so, what, what do I think the Bandung Philharmonic should do? You should organize some chamber music concerts and and where to make them play. I have the perfect place. Um, a few weeks ago, the hotels opened up. So. My guess is that the guest thing at the hotels is very few, but there will be people in there to listen and they are spaces. A lot of these hotels have huge lobbies where there's a piano already maybe. You can put a string quartet in the middle, safely spaced out enough that they could make music together, but people could hear and see. It just, I, I think I was inspired by those stories of um, when Italy went into crash down and it became the epicenter of the virus and 
And how did people respond? Well, they, they went out in their apartments on their balconies and they played music together. They sat up there and sang and took their violins. And it was like, it was, it was, it was inspiring to know that there are, even with all this going on, that there's still music to be made and, and music that people want to listen to. So yes, of course, I am, I am moving very forward with the, the online teaching that I have to do. But in the end, I think we have to, I think we have to get moving with real sound. So that's what I've been thinking about. Thank you. Thanks. I actually do agree with you because I believe in the magic of uh, in live music. Uh, we're actually lucky because we do have a partnership with the Hilton Hotel and because the it's not actually a concert hall. The seats are not fixed. So we don't have to like actually remove seats or you know assign people we could just work it out with the chairs and with the room so i think that's one positive thing we have going for us so that hotel has balconies it has many levels you could you could put musicians up on a place where no one could even see them but yet the, here comes the sound and no one would mistake no one would mistake live sound for a recording Yes, yes. Well, thank you for those great ideas, Chris. And thanks for sharing what's been going on in Salaya. Um, I will give the floor to Leslie Tan. And there's a question actually that has to do, it's for you, probably you can answer, Leslie, is uh, in light of the financial crisis, you were saying you had a contract that just got caught off. Um, how are musicians that their income is mainly for from performance supposed to survive the so maybe you can help us answer. I think financially it's going to be a, the, the question of how we're going to survive. That's a, a tough one. I, I, I think we need to be more entrepreneurial and find ways of um, attracting, um, for example, students. You see, like, for example, Gabriel didn't expect that he would get someone from Moa calling, but we are as far away as the next... Um, uh, sign into the internet you know um it doesn't matter if you're next door to me or you are a thousand miles away i cannot see you face to face so everything is done online so we're as far as um the the internet connection and i think we need to find ways to do these sort of things um i really don't have a question um, an answer as to what how we can survive this as musicians i'm lucky because i've been in this industry for long enough i've had some savings and I can sort of tide myself over for a year or so, right? But um, for the younger musicians or those who are just starting off, um, I think what they need to do now is to think of what, really start thinking of what they can do in the next next month onwards or, or immediate, you know, um, to find ways to make money. Um, I agree with uh, all of you. I think we need to get the live thing going. And I agree with Chris that chamber music, small ensembles, that's the thing. I mean, there's no justification to... I'm sorry to say that, and I have a lot of orchestra musician friends, and I started off in the orchestra. There's really no justification in this period now to, to pay a full-size orchestra and only to get like 100 people in the audience. There's no justification for that sort of numbers, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, with a smaller group, and with the local people, and this now we need to start exploring possibilities. There are possibilities. You just need to convince the government, the of officials, the authority that it's possible. Even be when, even before we had the shutdown, I was going to take my. Uh, so for those of you who know me, I have a pink Volkswagen van, and I was going to take that van with musicians and go around Singapore and play concerts, but the authorities were afraid of crowd control how to make people not but you know it's very easy you just set off a cordon and you tell people not to come and they said people know they have to stand further apart and i was going to take that around singapore um things like that i think we need to think of really strange ways of doing things just to tie us over i online content is very good but i'm very worried that once we start doing online content a lot of it is free we spoil our own market Right, it, it, people start going online. I mean, all these big orchestra, Berlin Phil, and what they're putting out all their operas and all their concerts. That's dangerous. You have free content. People will get used to it. People may not want to um, come for live concerts. I don't think that there's that danger, but there is. You know, it's a for me. It's 
it's dangerous. We have to be careful not to cannibalize our own livelihood. Um, there are methods when you go online, for example, if you go on this um, um, platform called Patreon, people pay to be a member and then you can um, ask the artist to, oh, I, you know, for $25, I would like to, you know, do this, that, that, for you to play this or that. It, it's slightly different than just a YouTube channel. So we have to be very careful how to capitalize on this without being very short term and, 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 and um, short sighted. And, and then we get into financial problems in the long term. But I, I do agree with Chris that chamber music um, and maybe solo stuff, just go out there and just do your stuff. Especially now that people are have, have become more accepting of the fact that uh, this is going to be with us for a long time. And a lot of the protocols have been set in place, how to crowd control, how to distance yourself. I think we can start moving out there um, as, as, uh, as artists to reach out to people already. But, but for a fee still, we have to convince people that, you know, I'm not going to take my usual how many thousand dollars or whatever, but you know, at least give me expenses or something. I, I think we need to, it's a negotiation. Thanks for that, Leslie. And I think that same question is also um, available for Gabriel. Let's let, oh, does Chris want to make a comment first? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the same thing. Um, your, the necessity to support yourself depends on your life situation, totally. So if you're young and you have a, a family who can support you, um, I, I would say go home stay with your family and let them support you while you practice and these things. But if you have to support yourself, you have a family like I do, um, what are you supposed to do? Um, I was fortunate when I was in school, um, my first, when I was an undergraduate, my, my teacher told me it'd be better to study music education than performance. And it, it, he was so right. When I got to graduate school playing performance, I found myself conducting youth orchestras because I was the only performer who could. And when I was there, I thought, well, I'm a bassoon player. I'm never gonna have a lot of bassoon students at university, so let me study theory pedagogy. And I did, and the, studying these things, making myself more broad, um, more well-rounded, I would say, um, is obviously what helps us through these situations being able to do more things. Obviously you can't go back and redo your degree, but there are, you can learn anything online now. You can learn to do anything, code, website, anything you wanna learn, you can learn online right now. And the answer for me was teaching English. So there's a huge market here for, teach, for students wanna study English, especially with native speakers. It's easy for my, me to find students. And as soon as this happened, I got all sorts of offers all sorts of offers for teaching because this, all, the, the, the international teachers all went home. But if it wasn't this, I would have learned something new online. I mean, there's just no choice. I mean, until we can weather this, you have to find something to support yourself. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, I have to feed my family. It, it doesn't matter at this point if it's music or not. Yeah, I agree with you. Whatever it is, I mean, if your life situation calls for it, you got to stand up and you got to be strong and you got to figure it out. Um, I'll uh, pass it to Gabriel because I think, Gabriel, you actually added students at this time. So you want to share a little bit about uh, that and also how you're financially managing. Yeah, um, actually, I, I really agree with um, Chris and Leslie. I think now actually is the time of teaching and learning. Definitely, we want to get back to performing as soon as possible. But, you know, with the, with the way things are looking, uh, with social distancing, a lot of types of performances won't uh, be possible. So, um, yeah, I mean, how do we continue to put food on the table, right? We need to um, definitely get into a little bit more teaching. But at the same time, I think we should also prepare for life after COVID. We need to start thinking ahead. How can we get back to full steam, you know, once once the virus is cleared? Um, and like what Chris and Leslie also said just now, you know, as soon as this is possible, um, you know, going out in small groups, performing, keeping the, the whole uh, culture of uh, live music alive. Um, and also, I think with social distancing, it's, it's a really good opportunity for us to rethink the whole concert experience, you know, or like um, 
what people call the the UX, right? The user experience in like more like corporate terms. Um, you know, how people feel comfortable going to a concert um, because you know with all these uh, online collaborations, digital um, videos that we've been doing, um, certainly it's going to reach us. I mean, help us get to wider audiences, right? People that usually don't watch concerts, maybe they might um, watch one of our videos, especially if it's like more educational or something, you know, from a special angle. And um, with these new audiences, how do we get them to actually come to our live concerts once um, it's actually possible, right? So um, I think, you know, with this social distancing, we can start thinking on ways to encourage, um, you know, interaction within reasonable, um, you know, distance, um, helping them to, to feel a more sense of a community because now, you know, we are, we are going to be performing to smaller audiences. And so how do we get them to feel like this is actually worth traveling down for, you know, to, to go and watch a concert, not just, um, watching it, but also interacting with the artists. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. So we are running a little bit on overtime, but I think we had a really great discussion. Um, some of the summary bottom line that a lot of uh, you mentioned was definitely going virtual uh, is going to be a big part of the future. So beef yourself up, get retrained on how to technically be able to do it. Um, and if you have to relearn stuff, then relearn. And uh, if you have to invest in some equipment, if you are in a privileged and able to invest in the equipment that you need, then do invest in such. Um, definitely new skills, as much well-rounded as you can make yourself, that would be very, very good, whether it's music or not. Um, I like what Leslie said, strange ways of doing things. Start thinking of strange ways of doing things. We're living in strange times, and strange times need strange new approaches. So definitely a call for um, strange new approaches. Is there any last comments from our panelists before we end today's discussion? Uh, did Dr. Joel, did you raise your hand for a last comment? Okay, go ahead. Uh, Gabriel touched on a very important word and the word is community. And I think most of us performers tend to forget that when we make music, we make music in community. Um, and that we do things together, not just the music, but also this human aspect of, of being able to touch the other person's, you know, the whole, the whole person. So I think what's also important for us, especially leaders or instructors or professors or, you know, uh, musicians who are, uh, how do you call, uh, part-timing and all that, is to be able to get in touch with other musicians, you know, on a very personal level to, to just simply connect. I think uh, what's important is that they feel that they're not alone um, and that they, because it's a psychological aspect to this, right? You go through the five levels of grief, <laughs> stages of grief. And, and sometimes we performers like to just simply, you know, let's perform. All these things will uh, settle down but there's a human aspect to it and certainly we want to be able to be sensitive to that and to be other centered you know other musicians are also hurting so the more we try to listen to them i think the better they will feel thank you very much yes uh, your hand festival was about emphasizing the stories so the why of performing arts, the stories and the whys. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other panelists have last comments? All right, Leslie and Chris would make it very short, please. I, I think um, for, the, for the attendees and for the younger musicians who are listening in, I think you need to really uh, um, start speaking, start talking to each other. I, now is not the time for competition. And, you know, when I'm using this time to think of what I can do for the future, but not for myself. I, there are a lot of us, the older musicians, the ones who are used to be, being mentors. We are thinking already of what we can do for the, for the next generation. My time is almost up. I'm trying to use this period to think of what we can do 
for the next generation, for the for the people who are struggling. I'm not thinking it for myself, you know. And I think um, the young ones need to start talking to, together, start talking and, and not start competing. There's no time for competition. Together we are stronger. This uh, the aspect of community, how do we overcome this as, as, as one whole group of people, not, not as individuals? That's not going to work. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, I've think, been thinking about um, the community and, and locally how we're going to need to do things in the future. And I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity now for us to retouch with our local communities. You know, music performance is a bit elitist in that we play music that only appeals to a certain group of people. And that might not be our audience right now. You know, we can't open these big concert halls and the music that we play, we, I, I just know in our own performances that if we could find a way to, to touch local audiences, we would have more people and it, it might be a necessity right now. Thanks for that, Chris. All right. So we are going to end tonight, uh, today's session. So thank you very much again to all of our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. We hope that this has helped you. And if there's any feedback, you can reply back to uh, the email info at bandingfilharmonic.org. So again, thank you very much. Stay healthy, keep with the community, and keep trying, yeah. don't give up.